Welcome to Pacific Mammal Researchers Marine Mammal Highlight Series. We are a 501c3 research and education nonprofit studying marine mammals in the Salish Sea off Washington State. In this series, you will learn about different marine mammals as we discuss interesting facts about each species. This is our way to geek out, share some information, and have some fun. We hope you enjoy the series and be sure to follow us on Instagram to vote for which animal we talk about next. And without further ado, Welcome to the Pac-Man Podcast. I'm Cindy. And I'm Kat. And uh, so this week is a Marine Mammal Highlight. And um, we had our poll up. And we've only had this happen like once or twice before. But it was a dead heat. 50%, 50% between the harp seal and the, what was the Galapagos sea lion, I think, that we put on there. I think so. Part? Or was yeah. it the Galapagos fur seal, I think? I can't remember. Uh, I can't remember. It was Galapagos something. Oh, here we go. Oh, uh, yes. It was the Galapagos first. Yeah, I wrote it down. <laughs> it's been so long. It's been like a few days. Um, but anyway, yeah. So uh, I, I honestly was surprised. I thought the harp seal was going to win out because it's, it, you know, the epitome of the cute, white, fluffy um, pup that everybody's seen. Uh, but it was 50 50. So that when that happens, it comes down to what we want to do. And I made the executive decision to do the harp seal because I like the cute little white, fluffy seal. So. Uh, we're going to do the harp seal today. <clears throat> Good decision. Thank you. Um, so we're excited to do this, to, um, to get going on this one. These are some very interesting guys. And like I said, this is, uh, I think, I think most people, when they think of seal, or a lot of people at least, think of this seal because it is, has been, it's, it's, the, it's the cute white fluffy babies that, you know, when they come out, they're white and fluffies we'll talk about. Um, and so they are kind of poster childs, of, especially the Arctic species. Um, and there's mm -hmm. other reasons why people would have heard about them as well, which we'll talk about. But um, anyway, I think it's kind of like a, a poster child seal for, for many people. <clears throat> yeah, they're very, very charismatic seal. Yes, exactly. I mean, their faces in the light fur is just adorable when they're born. Super cute. Um, okay, so <clears throat> we're going to get started then. And Kat will tell us about their... Um, they look like in their distribution and uh, before I get into the behavior and diet. Yeah. So these guys are uh, what we call true seals. So that means that they do not have any external ear flaps. So they just have little holes on the side of their head. And it also means in terms of movement that they are um, basically moving like a little worm kind of inching along on the, um, on the ice flows versus being able to rotate their hips underneath and kind of waddle along like a sea lion does. So just a little bit of a visual there before we get started. So these are the true seals. Um, harp seals are about five to six feet in length. They can weigh up to about 260 to 300 pounds. And as you might expect with an Arctic species, which we'll get into in just a second, um, they do have a pretty stocky and robust body. So again, to be able to have those additional fat stores and everything that they need. Insulation. Um, Insulation is key. Um, <laughs> and so in terms of where these guys do live, they are found in the cold subpolar and polar waters of the North Atlantic and Arctic Oceans. So this is all the way from, um, from Russia to the Gulf of St. Lawrence in Canada. Um, and so they spend most of their lives in the water and on the pack ice there, which Cindy will talk about in terms of how that fits into their life history. Um, there and are so three, let's just, let's just, uh, uh, d define pack ice. Cause I you know that that one. Is, oh is yeah. Go for people. it. Yeah. So, yeah. um, pack ice is, is basically frozen seawater that is not land fast. So land fast ice is stuff that is connected to the land. So these pack ice are, it, it grows in the winter. <clears throat> um, and they, but, it, but it's, it, they're mobile. So they're like large chunks of ice that are frozen, but aren't connected to the land at all. So it allows them to kind of float and move along um, and very important for these seals. So that's what we talk about mm -hmm. when we're talking about pack ice, what that means. Yeah, good call, good call. Um, so in terms of their populations in general, before we get into more specifics about what they look like, there are actually three distinct populations of harp seals um, that are found in the North Atlantic and Arctic Oceans. And each of these groups actually does have um, differences in their, uh, slight differences anyway, in their morphology, genetics, and behavioral characteristics. So um, they've, they've kind of grouped them based on their pupping sites. Mm -hmm. um, and so they are, uh, the, there is the Northwest Atlantic group, the Northeast Atlantic or Greenland Sea group, 
is number two. And then finally, the Barent Sea or White Sea group as well. Um, back in the day, the harp seals were also found in the Baltic Sea, um, but they have been extirpated from that area for quite some time now, apparently. Um, so what do these guys actually look like? Like Cindy mentioned at the top, they are kind of the poster child, I feel like, for seals in general. Um, so like I said, they're about five to six feet long, have this stocky, pretty robust body with a small flat head. Um, the pups, this is what everybody sees pictures of, right? The pups um, basically start out as white. Um, their coat is white. It's called a lanugo coat. Um, lasts until they're about three to four weeks old. Yeah, they're they're um, like little white puff balls like i mean yeah i was gonna say like, i saw your face doing something i'm like wait a minute <laughs> but, i mean it just it like little snowballs basically and with a little tight little seal face on it it's pretty ridiculous it's super cute and it's not just there because it's cute obviously that helps but the white fur does help to absorb sunlight and trap heat um in that cold arctic temperature and also allows um additional camouflage to help hide them from predators when they're on the ice um so like I said, that lasts about three to four weeks um, before they start getting and molting into their their different um, different types of coat, which happen at different life stages. I'm going to let Cindy talk about the life stages because it's really interesting. <laughs> um, so I'm going to kind of skip ahead into what they look like when they're adult. So yeah. the adult harp seals do actually look quite different. So they have a lighter gray fur um, with a really uh, actually like really attractive kind of black mask on their face. It's very elegant looking and a curved black patch on their back. And so the reason they have their name of harp seal is because somebody at some point thought that that black patch on their back resembled a harp. Cindy I, massively disagrees. <laughs> I massively disagree. I, was, I cannot see it. Like I, I found a picture that was just the back. I'm like, I'm, I'm looking for this. I'm looking for a harp and I, 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 I just can't see it. I just so so basically y'all need to go google harp seals and yeah. then drop a comment in and let us know if you can see the harp or not yep <laughs> Perhaps we want on, to know. if you're watching this on youtube i think i'm going to put up a, a a pup picture and then also the adult picture so you guys can yeah see for yourself for sure for sure <laughs> but it's not um so again <laughs> well no in the eye of the beholder apparently yeah. who knows maybe harps look different back in the day when they were naming them you That's know mm -hmm. i don't know it's a pretty <laughs> name either way it is um so again, mostly light gray, they have this black mask and then this curved black patch on the back. They do also have some dark spots that are kind of randomly scattered over their body as well. Um, and in terms of their other morphology, they have pretty thick front flippers with nice, um, big, strong claws and their back flippers have much smaller, narrower claws. So they do have claws on both sets of flippers, which is interesting. Hmm. Um, let's see, what else did I wanna say? I would have figured um, since the, 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 the peck fins are bigger and stronger probably for being in the ice and be able to call up at least some or scratch so. through ice, things like that. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's fairly typical of the other Arctic species that we've talked about. They typically do have much stronger um, front flippers and those bigger claws just to be, like you said, to be able to scratch through the ice or to be able to cling onto that slippery ice surface. Um. I think that was about it that I had for their appearance and their distribution. Um, again, we will be talking, um, or at least I will be talking mostly about harp seals as a whole. I'm not going to really split it too much into those three distinct populations. We're really going to kind of do the broad species overview, but Thank just you. to make you aware, aware that there are, make you aware oh, that there are, <laughs> that was funny. Wow. Um, <laughs> there are that those three different stocks that we are encompassing in this as well. Yes. So yeah, those are, are, they all are, you know, genetically, morphologically, behaviorally slightly different, but for our terms, basically everything's, the stuff we're going to be talking about is basically the same for, for all those, as, as far as we can tell. So <clears throat> um, let's go into uh, their diet and behavior then. Um, and so I actually, like, I thought we'd have, there'd be a little bit more detailed information about these guys because oh, they're pretty well known. Um but there was, it was a lot of it was just a bit more general. I guess I was just expecting a bit more detail. But um, for their food, this is real actually very interesting. Um, so they, we've talked about generalist predators before, <laughs> right? And um, you know, for example, harvest seals eat sixty or more different different species. That that seems like a lot. 
these guys eat more than 130 different species of fish and invertebrates. 130. Wow. In one study, they found uh, individuals with more than 65 species of fish and 70 species of invertebrates in their stomachs, like in one seal. Oh my gosh. Why? Yeah, they're just like one, 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 one. <laughs> just like tasting the next thing, I guess. I don't know. It's Weird. Super crazy. Um, huh. And so I thought I, I, that's the most species I've ever seen encompassed in a diet <laughs> before. Yeah. Um, and so it, it, the other thing that's uh, interesting is that, um, they, it's most commonly the uh, small fish like capelin, Arctic cod and polar cod, um, also krill. They do eat actually quite a bit of krill. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit later in one study in the new research. Um, but for a long time as, as with other seals that we've talked about here and there, um, their competition or seen as competition for some commercial fisheries. And so they basically have been the blame a lot and a lot for the Atlantic cod to, uh, collapse. Um, that's oh, a very commercially important species. But you'll notice I said Arctic cod and polar cod, not Atlantic cod in their, in their diet, right? And so multiple studies have shown that the impacts from the seals of them eating Atlantic cod are not at all a part of the species decline. Um, and so there was a, a recent study of uh, Beren et al. Um, and they used a bioenergetics allometric model basically a model. <laughs> um, and they looked at relative contributions of the different drivers on the lack of recovery and dynamics of that cod stock. Um, and basically the, the, the dynamics that they saw were best explained by a combination of fisheries removals and Kaplan, ca uh, Kaplan availability. So the prey okay. of the cod, um, whereas seal consumption was found to not be an important driver whatsoever, like it did not affect mm -hmm. the cod stocks. Um, so it suggests that the trophic control is bottom up rather than top down from the predator uh, and that depressed Kaplan stocks could be a serious impediment for cod rebuilding. So this is why it's so important to know exactly what they're eating, how much they're eating, because just because they eat some or you see them eat some doesn't mean that they're actually impacting um, that as much as you think they are. So yeah, interesting. And they eat 130 different species. So it could certainly impact one more than the other really. Ah, wow. That's wild. Yeah. So uh, I found this interesting when I read this. I'm like, they dive up to 1,300 feet. I was like, whoa, that's pretty far. But they're like, eh, they're only a go to 1,300 feet. So apparently not really strong compared to other seals. Um, and they also, the, they only hold their breath for 16 minutes. And I'm like, that still seems lame. Lame <laughs> <Right>? comparison. <laughs> I was like, geez, fine, guys. I mean, 60 minutes seems pretty long to me, but okay. Um, also, so, if you imagine holding your breath in like the Arctic water too, <laughs> like I'm just thinking they're in like extreme cold water. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that, that's another level of ability to hold your breath. <laughs> yeah. It's not like 16 minutes in like temperate, tropical, you know, warm waters. It's two different things for sure. Um, so anyway, they, they, they seem pretty cool to me, but apparently not as, not as good as other, other seals that we've uh, talked about. <laughs> um, so that's basically what we have for diet for, uh, behavior. So these guys also um, are gregarious in terms of when they um, they gather on pack ice in very large groups during the breeding and molting season. Um, and these can be up to like a thousand or 2000 seals. I mean, it's just like wow. party time. Yeah. Um, there was one paper that should, that, or one website that said there were, uh, could be up to 2000 seals per square kilometer. Oh so, my gosh. I mean, they're packed. If there's 2,000 wow. seals in that, I mean, that's not even a square mile. Like, square cod are smaller than a square mile. <laughs> like, oh, that'd be so cool to see. I know, right? Just like, there would be no space. Um, yeah. So when they, um, uh, they get out, so they get out to breed, and I'll talk about breeding in a minute with re their reproduction. Um, but breeding occurs basically February, um, February and March, and then they molt their their fur, uh, and we'll talk about that in a second too. But during April and May, then they feed they feed very little during that time, just like most other seals when they when they molt their hair, um, and then they go off to feed in the summer and the fall um, very intensely, and then migrate back down to the land fest. Uh, um, at, they migrate down as the land fest ice increases, so the ice that mm. like, completely covers everything, you can't get through it. Um, as that increases, they move away, go down to the more southern winter breeding grounds to have their babies <clears throat> and then mate again. Um, 
though they did show that some juveniles and some non-breeding adults stay in the North year round. So if you don't have to oh, go breed, yeah, you wouldn't necessarily need to leave. You just need to make sure you don't get covered in ice. <laughs> you can't breathe. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, and then there was interesting because, you know, the three different populations, there's no evidence of breeding between the populations, right? Where they're genetically distinct, but they have documented some young seals moving between them. So. Mm -hmm. Which is really interesting. Mm -hmm. So it's like, is that always happen and they just don't breed? Or is it something that's starting, you know, maybe we'll start some some connections? Who knows? Mm -hmm. um, could be quite interesting. And and it could very well be that some of those are actually breeding. And then you just don't, um, if, there's only, if there's only one pup that comes from that, you're not going to see that in genetic assessments, right? It has to be quite a few. Right. So it may be happening. You just can't document it. Um, so they'll also feed and travel in large groups. So this is kind of kind of different than a lot of seals. A lot of seals are much more solitary in nature. Uh, these guys tend to kind of group together. Um, and so they go during those seasonal migrations. They'll travel away from the pack ice during the summer and follow the ice north to feed in the Arctic. Um, and their annual migration can be 3,100 miles round trip. Wow. So they're, they're doing a, a fair amount for little seals. If um, what's interesting is that, you know, you're, you're saying that basically, um, uh, in Canada's kind of, their kind of Southern range, they have sometimes been seen as far South as New England. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it, they said it's not unusual, but still rare. So you have yeah. those walkabout animals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I'm going to go be a tourist in New England. Um, so that would be super cool to see. Um, and so, as Kat did say, they spend most of their lives in the water, but some are known to ride bits of drifting sea ice for short distances during migration, which makes total sense, ice. right? You're tired, just hop I on would. the ice and float. Yeah, <laughs> I totally would. Hitch a ride. Exactly. Not a bad way to go. <clears throat> okay, so now here's the really exciting stuff, the reproduction. Uh, and Kat and I are excited about this because the names that they have for the different age stages are fantastic. Um, awesome. So... <laughs> Um, their max life is about 30 years, but uh, DFO from Canada said 25 to 40, so somewhere within that. Um, sexually mature at seven to eight for males and four to seven for females. So females start having babies a little bit younger. Um, they mate in the water or on top of ice flows. Uh, and uh, the courting rituals include calling, blowing bubbles underwater, making pawing gestures, and chasing females on the ice. Oh, so, that sounds I mean, kind of cute. Come hither, come hither, female. <laughs> come. So cute. And then if she doesn't start chasing her. <laughs> right. And in that that's a little bit less, that's a little bit less cute, but yeah. I like the blowing bubble. That's mm -hmm. fun. Yeah. Blowing bubbles and making calling gestures. Mm -hmm. Very cute. <laughs> um, and they'll mate, um, basically they'll give birth and then mate right after, just like most other seals do. And they have that delayed implantation for about four months um, where the, the, um, fertilized egg just kind of floats around in the uterus uh, until it's in, until four months goes by and then it implants. And then, so the total gestation with that four months is 11 and a half months. So it makes it so that they are ready to give birth again when that pack ice is available for them. Cause that's, they need that for, um, for their birth, birthing. So um, they give birth in that late February, mid March in the Southern limit of their range um, on that pack ice. <clears throat> And this is where they nurse their pups. Um, each, as Kat said, each population has a specific pupping site. Um, and so when they're born, they're they're called yellow coats because they're when they're first born, they're they're kind of this tingy yellow. But within a few days, it basically turns into that white fluffy coat that we are all know and love. So that um, they'll molt that white coat uh, starting at about ten days and, and is done by about three weeks, like Kat said. And if they still have some white tufts still in it, like they're they're kind of still in the middle and I like haven't quite got rid of it, they're called ragged jackets. Oh my gosh. <laughs> they're just like rough, rough and ready because they haven't fully, fully fledged. <laughs> it's like the, when you see little chicks where they still have some of their kind of downy feathers, they haven't grown into their full feather um, plumage yet. It looks so cute. I was literally just thinking the same thing, like little eagles and yep. stuff. They're still kind of <laughs> yeah, got those little tufts sticking out here and there mm -hmm. of their baby baby exactly. feathers. Exactly. Oh, fun. So then, um, uh, they have that till about three weeks, and then at that point, they have these their juveniles now that have um, a gray with dark spotted coat, um, and these are called beaters. 
And when I first heard that, I was like, oh, I think I know why, because as we're going to talk about hunting a little bit, um, but it's not that. It's because of the sound they make when they learn to swim. <laughs> oh. Yeah. I mean, I like that because it's not about, you know, right. targeting them, but that's, mm-hmm. I wonder what the sound is. I don't know. Like, and why is it any different than any other seal? Like, are they just like so awkward at it that it makes a weird sound? I don't know. Weird. <laughs> so huh. then at then at 13 or 14 months, and I think this is one of the few seals that has this many different coats. Like usually it's just you got yeah. one and that's it, or maybe two. Um, mm-hmm. At about a year old, 13 to 14 months, they molt again, um, but the spots remain and they're larger. So it's, um, they kind of coalesce, I guess. And they're called bed lamers. Oh, the bedlamers? Yeah. Bedlamers. So, so bedlam, bedlam, bedlam is like insanity, right? Like when you say, oh, it's complete bedlam in there. Like it's just nuts. That they, it's, you know, so I'm just, I was like thinking of it as almost like teenagers where I'm like, um, where is this? I wonder, but I'm, I'm thinking maybe it's more the spots where it's like the spots have kind of gone crazy on their body okay. visually. Yeah. I don't know. That makes but yeah, that's what bedlam means. Sense. Just bedlam is just like it, it, things are nuts. Cause I, uh, cause I read it as bedlamers and I was like, bedlamers, like what? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think about bedlam like that makes a lot more sense um because they, there was no explanation for that one I think it's funny they had explanation for every other one but not that one but I I like that one I yeah that. um and so they have this uh bedlam appearance uh until they reach sexual maturity when they get their adult coat adult coat which is about four to five or six years of age um and so then and then at the adult they're called harp seals because they have supposedly a harp on their back in that spot um, but if they don't fully develop the, some of them don't fully develop the, the quote unquote heart shape. And so they're called oh. spotted harps. Ooh, yeah. cool. I think I might like spotted harps better. It's pretty nice. <laughs> <laughs> Especially since I can't see the harp in the first place, but that's okay. <laughs> I digress. Um, uh, so that, I think that's one of the, the most fun naming ones we've had of any species because they've got like five different names depending on their, their age. Yeah. Very cool. Um, uh, and I'm going to end with how amazing these animals are in terms of what happens when they're born, being in that cold water. Um, as we've talked about before in some other species, the, the the more northern species, the Arctic species, basically don't nurse for very long. Super, super high rich, like 50% fat milk. Um, these guys nurse for 12 days. Like you got to just wow. get it. Um, they gain five pounds per day. Uh, and develop a thick blubber, blubber blubber layer. So when they're first born, they have all the hair to keep them warm, but then they need to bulk up their blubber. Um, and so when they're at 80 pounds, uh, they started up 25. So it, they go from 25 to 80 pounds in 12 days. Oh my God. <laughs> Isn't that bonkers? I mean, it would just be, it would be like blowing up a balloon. Like it would just be like physically watching these things just like expand day to day Seriously, to day. Seriously, I think you could do a time-lapse photography and see them grow. Like, oh yeah. It's a period. It's bonkers. Yeah. So it's just, it's a, the, that ability, that it's just very impressive, right? That's that's a, a lot to be able to do uh, physiologically. Um, so uh, they do that. And then the females leave the weaned pups <clears throat> on the pack ice um, and the fields, females go off to mate. Um, and they, they the pups will stay on the pack ice for, the, for about six weeks, not eating, very similar to other, other seals as well. So they'll lose up to half of their body weight. So they just gained like 60 pounds. <laughs> And then they're going to lose like 40 of it. Like, it seems like not great evolution, but it, it works for them. <laughs> um, and so basically they get really hungry and then they'll be like, okay, I guess I'll go into the water and try to figure out how to feed, mm. which they do on their own because mom's not there to teach them. So I guess it is great then because otherwise if the mom was still able to feed them, then they would just continue to be fed and they wouldn't actually, like yeah, they wouldn't actually take it. those first steps to, to mm-hmm. go forage. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. So if you think you have it hard, just think about harp seals that just get nursed for 12 days left alone and then have to figure out how to find fish on their own. <laughs> Maybe that's why they- Yeah, yeah that's pretty things. hardcore. <laughs> for real. Oh, yeah. Yeah, true. I mean, they're just like, right. I'm going to eat whatever comes in front of my face, you know? Yep. Yep. Um, I mean, I would. <laughs> right? <laughs> you got to get that weight back, man. Because if you don't have blubber, you're going to you're gonna freeze. You have yeah. to have that good blubber layer. Um, so the females will actually do a an, an very intense feeding before going to molt. So they they will they mate. I mean, they give birth. They then go mate. Then they go feed their guts out, <laughs> and then they will go to molt uh, in April uh, and before then you know heading off to feed regularly. 
But what's interesting is the males will stay at the breeding area and not feed as heavily or possibly at all, uh, at all, um, in hopes of mating before molting. So, you know, a female oh. may only have to do like, hey, if they do it a couple of times, something's stuck, I'm good to go. I, no point in mating more. But males, that you know, they need to mate as much as possible to pass on their genes. So they kind of get the short end of the stick of not getting to feed a bunch before then going into molt for a little while. <laughs> wow. But um, they also didn't have to give birth. So there's that. So they probably have more, true. they have, they have some more reserves to hold up on than the females do. Good point. Cause they, they didn't say much about the females, but you know, if, if they're at like any of the other seals we talked about that lactation process for that 12 days, they probably lost, you know, dozens of pounds. Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, process. if it's that high of a milk fat content, yeah. they're going to lose some, some weight through that for sure. Yeah. So they need to go then do some intense feeding before they then don't feed for a while to molt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, whereas the males don't have to do that. So pros and cons, right? Teach side. Um, so that is the very, very interesting story of uh, how harp seals are born and um, and what they do during the day. So basically, I, they're just, you know, migrating, feeding, and hanging out on pack ice. That's pretty much what I got for behavior. <laughs> um, nice. So Yes. So with that, we will take a quick break and be back with the threats and some new research. We'll be back in just a minute. All right, we're back. Now, uh, Kat's gonna tell us about the um, their population status and their threats. And just, just a warning to begin with, the next two sections are gonna be talking about hunting. Uh, these seals are still actively hunted. Um, we're not gonna try to dwell on it too, too much or the details of it, but just so you know, that is something we will be uh, discussing if you don't wanna hear about it. Yeah, thank you, thank you. So in terms of how these guys are doing worldwide, it seems like they're actually doing fairly well as far as we know. Um, from what I could find, there are approximately about 9 million animals globally, um, with the vast majority of those in the Western North Atlantic stock. So that's like around about 7 million seals are actually part of that Western North Atlantic stock. So it's the vast majority, yeah, the vast majority of there. Um, the Greenland sea population is around about 430,000. That's the smallest population. And the Barents and White Sea population is 1.49 million at last estimate. So again, like solid sort of three quarters to slightly over three quarters is that Western North Atlantic stock. Um, the are, they are listed as a species of least concern by the IUCN because of this, you know, fairly, fairly decent sized population globally. And the fact that the population has significantly increased from, um, for example, the 1970s, which we will talk about in just a second as to why. Um, and the, the individual stocks do fall under management bodies within Canada, Greenland, Norway, and Russia. So these countries are basically, there's a joint scientific working group that helps to advise these different countries um, and create some sort of cohesion between how their stocks are managed, which I thought was actually very cool and kind of why I wanted to make a point of bringing that in here, because we don't often talk about how difficult it is to manage species that do cross different countries and different international boundaries that are not relevant to the animals. Um, but of course, they're very relevant to us and how we effectively conserve them. So I thought that was pretty neat that they actually, there is this kind of joint scientific work group that actually helps to facilitate um, and advise the different countries on how to manage these stocks. Yeah, I mean, it, it, that goes into you know, tragedy of the commons, especially if you're talking about hunting, you know, if one, one country is doing a whole bunch of hunting, no one's the other one, you're not, you may end up having a decline, even though you didn't do anything, but the other country did, you know, so you have to have those that conversation. So it's really great that they are actually doing that. Yeah. And especially when you do have very different population sizes. So for example, yeah. if you're talking about the Greenland stock, you may manage them differently than that Western North Atlantic stock too. And I'll talk um, about so that. So I just wanted to um, kind of throw that in there. Yeah. And I'll talk about that actually in, the, in the, one of the new research was talking about the differences in the population, in those three populations and what affects them and how different those are. So mm. it's very important to manage them differently. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So we've mentioned, we're getting into the threats now. So we've mentioned hunting already quite a lot, uh, <laughs> but basically the harp seals are 
one of the most well-known hunted seals. Um, they have been hunted for thousands and thousands of years by the indigenous peoples of the Arctic, um, as well as by some coastal Northern European peoples. Um, in terms of commercial hunting, um, this has been in effect since at least the 1600s. I believe that was when it first started being documented. Um, and typically they're being captured and killed for things like their meat, their fur, their blubber, which is then turned into oil, um, their skins, and also their reproductive parts, which are um, used in some uh, like Chinese, sold to things for like Chinese medicine and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So those are, you know, they're, they're using most of the animal really um, in terms of, of what they are being for. The peak of these catches was occurring between about uh, 1818 and 1862, uh, when about half a million seals were hunted annually. Mm. Uh, maximum yearly takes of, I believe, up to about 750,000 seals. Um, so this is why when we're talking about the the night, this continued for for centuries, right? So this was this was going on and going on, and so by the 1970s, um, there were only there were less than 1.5 million seals in that Western North Atlantic stock that were thought to make up the population. So just to see how much it's rebounded just since the 1970s is pretty wild. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, so because part of the reason that that has occurred is that DFO in Canada, Department of Fisheries and Oceans does set an annual, annual total allowable catch for commercial Aboriginal and personal use hunting. So this is again, very important to note that there are these different types of hunting that is being done still. Um, again, there is also some level of moderation of that within the different countries as well. Um, you know, Greenland, Russia, Norway, etc. Um, currently harp seals are taken mostly in the, um, Canadian and Norwegian commercial hunts and in the Greenland and Canadian Arctic subsistence hunts as well. Um, and there have also been several rules put into place regarding what age class the pups must be in or the, the seals must be in, you know, for them to be allowed to be killed um, in order to prevent, you know, basically the, the Lanugo pups that when they're first born, like they, they are no longer allowed to be um, taken because that then prevents the population from rebounding. Um, so things like that have also been put into place to try to allow these populations to recover um, and for, again, to it, for it to become some sort of a sustainable process, because, you know, it is important to note that a lot of people in that part of the world, in the Arctic region, rely on right. the, you know, the meat, the fur, the blubber, the skins, like they are used, like I said, that is one kind of good thing about this is they really are using all of the animal and it's essential for their, their, you know, sur the survival basically in that part of the world. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's always hard to see, you know, when you kill animals, um, even if it's needed, it's, you know, it's, it can be very hard, but I always find it much better if it, it's, it's way, oh, way, way worse if they're just like, oh, I'm just using this one thing and killing this animal for this one thing, not doing it. If you're using the whole animal, that's, that it's reasonable, right? It's like, that's the nature, you know, nature is nature, right? There's going to be killing predators and prey and all that kind of stuff. And so if at least you're using all, all of it, that's at least going to, there's nothing's going to waste, which is good. Mm -hmm. yeah so that really is the main really that's the main threat for these guys there are several more that i'll mention but that you know of course as we've already talked about that really is the biggest threat to their population and thankfully like i said there is quite a bit of management going on around it in an effort to you know prevent depletion of the population to an unsustainable degree so with the increase in numbers in that population it seems to be working which is great yeah, and some of the re new research I have kind of documents that as well. Um, and it, but it's interesting too that this is, I think, one of the few marine mammal species that has such a, a large scale in comparison hunt, where most everything else is like don't you know, we don't do that anymore. But this one is kind of the exception, yeah. which is interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, so the other big one to mention in terms of threat is, of course, climate change, because they rely on, um, you know, this, the availability of suitable sea ice to use. Um, like Cindy mentioned, the, the, the sea ice is essential for basically all parts of their, their life history. Um, and so they are one of the more sensitive species to climate change that would impact uh, sea ice formation and or breakup as well as the timing of that occurring. So again, like I was mentioning, they're very, they're almost on a timer, right? They have these very specific periods of doing specific life behavior or life history behaviors. 
And if you start to shift the timing of when sea ice is available versus when it's not, you could have things like, you know, the delayed implantation goes all wonky, right? Where you don't, you're not actually giving birth at the correct time anymore because things are all starting to change around you. So they're very, it's not just the sea ice itself. It's also the timing and the environmental shifts that are causing those changes um, that could also directly and indirectly impact those animals. Mm -hmm. the, um, the trophic mismatching is the term for ooh, that yeah. when when you have the, basically that timing is off like oh the flowers bloom and the birds come here to the nectar but then if they go at the wrong time they don't get there and the flowers are gone and then it, they're that so it's that kind of uh, idea that we're talking about there with the sea ice and if they have doing things at the right time yeah and that's the thing we're like, on an off year okay that might not be devastating but if that yeah. starts to become a consistent thing where it's just too variable that's a massive problem for yeah. for their populations yeah. Um, some other things that they are at risk of, um, vessel strikes. So again, they are, you know, interacting with, um, vessels up in the Arctic as well. Um, inadvertent vessel strikes can injure or kill harp seals. Um, they are more vulnerable than some other Arctic species to that. I think just because they are, um, navigating in that the more slightly more open water, they're, mm -hmm. they're traveling in those areas between the ice flows. Um, but of course, if they live in coastal areas with heavier ship traffic, that's obviously a much higher risk of, um, vessel strike. And also they're small. So if you're on a big vessel and you don't see it, you're not, you're, you're probably not going to see it. It's too small. It's not like a massive fin whale that you probably would see in the water, you know, right. um, entanglement is another one. So they are, they are known to become entangled in fishing gear or other types of marine debris. Um, so again, we've talked about this in multiple different podcasts. This is really just becoming a generic threat for anything that lives in the ocean, really, at this mm -hmm. point in time. Um, they are prone to entanglement with many different gear types, including gillnets, trawls, pursanes, or weirs. Um, again, like all these other species we've discussed before, this can be a direct mortality in terms of um, either... Uh, choking or strangling, um, not, you know, drowning because they can't reach the surface because they're too, they're too entangled. Um, or it can be more of an indirect effect where they drag the gear for long distances. It prevents them from uh, hunting correctly. Fatigue um, could increase their injury risk. And of course that leads to reduced ability to breed and uh, breed and feed really. And that's going to be more extreme in the in an Arctic environment because the it, the environment is extreme. So you have to yeah. deal with those cold waters, um, and you know it, it limits you a lot. So the the small amounts that that might reduce how much you eat will have larger impacts for those animals. Mm -hmm. And also, you're not. Um, this is a little bit different than say cetaceans, or, you know, whales and dolphins and porpoises that that spend their whole life in the water. Mm -hmm. Seals are not really spending the whole, especially these guys, they don't spend their whole time in the water. So if they are entangled and it's harder for them to get up onto the ice because they keep being dragged back down, yeah. they're not able to spend that much time in that water before they have to get out to prevent hypothermia. So, and even just rest, it, like just, to, yeah, just exactly. To, exactly. Yeah. They can't just kind of chill and just like take a breather in the water because it's not right. warm tropical water. You know, it's, right. it's a little bit different for them, as you said. A um, couple others here before we wrap up with these, the chemical contaminants. So again, you know, we've talked about that a lot with other species as well, but because these guys do have pretty solid blubber stores, um, they are more prone to uh, bioaccumulation of contaminants in their bodies, which of course, as we've discussed in other podcasts, leads to um, immune and reproductive system um, problems. It can lead to direct, basically direct toxicity poisoning. Um, if they become nutrient depleted and they have to activate those blubber stores to survive off of, they start basically dosing themselves with the chemicals that have built up in there. Um, and then finally, oil spills and energy exploration. This is becoming a common one with Arctic species that we talk about uh, simply because offshore oil and gas exploration has been much more um, common up in the Arctic in recent years. Um, and this basically has, again, those kind of direct or indirect impacts on harp seal populations. So the most significant risk for them would be basically an accidental oil spill um, or an accidental spill of other toxic substances. Um, and of course, because they are not 100% water dwelling, their coat is the only thing that can repel water. If they get covered in oil, the coat loses its ability to repel water and they freeze. Yeah, um, I would think. And of course, you know, also 
yeah, oh yeah. I mean, up there, yeah, it would probably be a matter of minutes. I would imagine you wouldn't have long. Um, of course, you know, obviously if they are then inhaling or swallowing any of those, um, you know, oil or toxic substances that can damage their, um, reproductive tract, digestive tract, respiratory centers and central nervous system as well. Um, so that's becoming, like I said, much more of a, of a consistent theme with Arctic species of this, this, um, threat of oil spills, uh, because of the continued exploration up in the Arctic. So just something to bear in mind, thankfully, um, you know, it hasn't happened on a massive scale at this point, but it's more, the more work and the more effort we have going on up there, the more development occurring, the more likely it is for that to happen at some point. Yeah. So yeah. that is all we have for the threats for the, I would imagine too, it's kind of harder to clean stuff up too, with oil spills up way up there than down in other locations. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing. That's a really good point. Cause right. Cause you don't have as many eyes on the water, number one. Mm -hmm. And then how do you get, um, you know, service vehicles up there to help contain that oil spill or that toxic spill and, and work in that environment. It's but they're really not meant to be in that kind of icy environment. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Really, really challenging. So yeah, that's a great point too. It's much harder to clean up and, yeah. and kind of res restrain in a small area. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I was telling Kat before we started, I was like, I have a hard time finding some newer research on these guys. I don't know. just because there's so many of them that there, there's not as much detail, but um, I was able to find a few and um, they basically mainly are talking about either, you know, hunting, um, ontogeny, so how they how they grow um, into different age classes and things like that and their morphology uh, and then effects of climate change. So I'm going to start off with the one about the harp seal hunt and then stop talking about hunting. <laughs> um, but this one was interesting because it was it's doused in Caraguel uh, at all uh, or doused in Caraguel 2012. The Canadian harp seal hunt, observations on the effectiveness of procedures to avoid poor animal welfare outcomes. So I thought this was a good one because they are looking to like, how can we do this hunt the most ethical, you know, the most, in the most ethical way possible, ethical way possible um, to, you know, you can kill them, but can we kill them quickly and do it, you know, with, with the least amount of pain. <clears throat> um, so they uh, went over several seasons that aimed at obtaining more specific information about the conditions under which the seals are killed in order to assess these welfare issues uh, and explore any avenues for possible improvements in practice. Um, there is a standardized three-step process for killing seals. Um, they uh, stunning, checking by palpitation of the skull and then bleeding. Um, and that, that, that was recently implemented to maximize um, the proportion of animals that are killed rapidly with minimum pain. So again, they are trying to make this as, as good as possible for you know, what they're doing. Um, and the study basically found on, based on current practices, there is no reliable evidence that the Canadian harp seal hunt differs from other forms of exploitation of wildlife resources from the perspective of animal welfare. So basically it seems like they're doing what they should be doing in order to make this um, the least amount of pain for the animals, which w was nice to, to know that they are actively looking into that, you know. Mm -hmm. And this is, I think, again, it's one of those that it's a very, uh, how do I say, like very widely publicized hunt as well. There's a lot of pictures. If you just Google harp seals, one of the first pictures you see is, you know, from a hunt of harp seal pups or not, well, not pups, but juveniles. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's one that I think people have seen a lot of imagery of, which is not common for these, mm -hmm. these subsistent hunts or commercial hunts. That's it's, they're not really documented visually in the same yeah. way that I think harp seal have been. So it's interesting that um, I could see people kind of really getting up in arms because it looks terrible. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting that they actually did undertake that and found that it's it's really the best that they can do under the circumstances and what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. And they, and I think Very they did cool. talk about there was a um, a specific type of of like hatchet or knife that they use. I can't remember the actual name of it. And then they actually some of them do rifle, um, and saying basically that the while the rifle works, but it's not good if they end up going in the water because then you're not sure if you got them and they could have prolonged yeah. you know things like that so they were really looking into the different ways and um Fair making enough. making good recommendations of what what should be done so cool. if it has to happen at least it can happen in a way that is the least amount of pain for the animals mm -hmm. um so moving on from that now <laughs> the next one is uh, stenson et al at 2020 uh, this is harp seals monitors of change in differing ecosystems so this is the one i referenced before when you were talking about the different groups um, and they actually looked at um, historic hunting data to look at population trends and the factors influencing influencing them over time. So they could look at, okay, well, how you know how much was the hunt that year and the size of the population. 
Um, and so basically there's a lot of details in there, but what I want you to come out with is that um, each of the populations has been impacted differently by changes in their ecosystems, like prey availability and other mortality besides the hunt, um, and then also hunting practices. So it, what they were saying is that if we identify the factors influencing these three populations, we can gain a better understanding of how species may respond to changes that are occurring in their ecosystems. So there was differences in their prey in uh, other mortalities, you know, diseases, things like that, along with the hunting practices between those three different populations and why they should be managed separately, right? That they're not all the mm -hmm. same. You can't just put a blanket thing over all three of them because there's different stuff going on. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. So again, good that they're looking into these things, right? And mm -hmm. to make that sustainable um, as needed. Uh, another one, so now we're gonna go into, um, I think I'll do climate change. Yeah, and then the rest of it is about um, you know, physiological stuff. But Stinson et al, 2016, um, a lot of these are the very, uh, a lot of uh, same authors on these uh, papers. Uh, the impact of cli changing climate and abundance on reproduction in an ice dependent species, the Northwest Atlantic harp seal. Uh, so climate change, as we kind of discussed, has been shown to affect harp seals directly through increased mortality of young. So the babies don't survive. Um, they increase from, as you said, 101.5 million seals in the early 70s to 7.4 million seals today. That was in 2016. Um, but since 1987, late term abortions have been observed. So there's been a lot mm -hmm. of, yeah, like aborting a fetus um, later in the process. Um, mm -hmm. They were, uh, pregnancy and abortion rates were estimated from samples between 1954 and 2014 off Newfoundland, Newfoundland. Uh, and they did a model that included Kaplan biomass and midwinter ice cover to see what was, you know, correlated. Um, and what they found was harp seals appear to respond to relatively small variations in environmental conditions uh, when they are at high population levels. So it was observed, um, uh, if the observed changes in climate continue, negative impacts on the Northwest Atlantic harp seal population will likely increase due to the predicted warming trend and associated reduce in ice cover. So even though they're doing well, the environment and the, the sea ice that you talked about with climate change um, and then corresponding prey, you know, if they're eating a lot of capelin, um, will have small variations in that can have large impacts on this population, which then goes into monitoring and seeing that and then adjusting how much hunting is, is being able to be done in that population as was talked about in the last paper. So um, all those things go together to have a more uh, sustainable population and sustainable harvest. Um, so then um, this one's my favorite title. It's uh, by Ginuka et al. 2015, um, The Fat and the Furriest, Morphological Changes in oh Harvest. Oh my gosh, I love it. With antogeny, isn't that great? The fat and the That's furious. awesome. Yeah. Um, so this is interesting. They looked at basically how things develop as they get older. So the hair becomes flatter and shorter in older animals, and the density decreased with age because you get more blubber, right? You're relying less on the hair and more on the blubber as you get older. Um, the number of hair bundles per unit area, an average number of under hair is present in any given bundle, changes associated with um, uh, happen, and then they that um, changes associated with reduced thermal resistance of the pelt, again, relying more on blubber. Um, and this is consistent with what's known for uh, ev the evolutionary patterns of, of fur morphology associated with, with that transfer from transition from blubber um, to, uh, from fur to blubber in aquatic species. So there's nothing new, except that this was the first time they showed that across age classes in a single species, which I thought mm -hmm. was kind of cool. So they're really showing that, yes, this is exactly what happens and why. Um, and overall, the timing of these ontogenetic changes may limit the ability of harp seals to adapt to the deterioration of sea ice in the Arctic as predicted with continued climate change. So mm. again, that mismatch timing. If things aren't happening at the right time frame, they're going to get too cold too quick and they're going to not make it. So important to know Interesting. Those how that develops um, with how the, things are changing. Yeah. Um, Oh, this was, a, oh, so now we're going into a little bit into diet. Uh, Lindstrom et al, 2012, harp seal foraging behavior during summer around Svalbard in the Northern Barents Sea, diet composition and the selection of prey. So this was in the Barents Sea ecosystem. Um, and they show that the harp seal diet com uh, composition varied significantly both in time and space uh, and their diets appeared to be size dependent. So in this particular location, the subadults and adults were mainly looking at pelagic crustaceans 
Um, adults were mainly um, looking at fish, but krill was the most important prey species, 63%. And then polar cod, 16%, and other fish, 10%. Um, so the end part of that is prey preference of harp seals varied in time and space, <laughs> which makes sense if they eat like 130 different things. So, <laughs> um, but again, goes back to those different populations, yeah. <laughs> right? Whatever's available, whatever's, you know, the, wherever they are and whatever's available will vary between these populations, which goes into how well they do with different climate changing things and um, all that kind of stuff. So um, <clears throat> the last, the last one I have here um, is a little interesting. It's Growl Nielsen et al. 2012, 2011. Fatty acids and harp seal blubber do not necessarily reflect their diet. So this is where you take, hmm. um, you know, blubber samples and look at the fatty acid composition and you can look at isotopes and things like that and, and determine what they're eating. Um, this is very common in a lot of, um, uh, a lot of different species studies. Uh, but what they found was interesting. Um, they did the Northwest Barrett Sea um, in uh, 2006. And they took the fatty acid composition of potential prey and the inner and outer sections of the seal blubber. So, um, because the level where the where the blubber is can have the composition of the molecules and chemicals in there can can change over time as it moves through the layer. Um, the blubber was uh, basically had was stratified, had different stuff on the on on the outer layer versus the inner layer, um, and it the fatty acid composition differed substantially among the potential prey species and between the prey and the blubber. So there was a, there was a lot of not matching, basically, is what was happening. Um, and so what they found was that there was a weak predator-prey relationship with respect to that fatty acid composition um, of the inner blubber layer. Uh, and the uh, prey suggested that the, um, the fatty acid composition of the inner layer was mainly predetermined by metabolism rather than the actual diet. So basically, mm. you can't use the inner blubber layer or maybe all the blubber layer to estimate prey for these animals, which you can for many other species, which was wow. kind of cool. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's one of those things, again, that's like, sounds kind of like you read the title, you're like, okay, why do we care? But then right. also that's really, really important for how you're doing these types of analyses. That's awesome. Yeah. Because I mean, like I said, that's a very, it's very common for, for species. They take samples and then you can figure out what they're eating and, and it matches up really well with, with it. And for these guys, it doesn't, which is hmm. very interesting. interesting, kind of extreme dudes. So, um, so yeah, so that's, that's what I got for, for harp seals. And I think we've, we've spent our time here. Um, so remember the, um, cute little white fluffy guys that turn into larger guys with a parent harp on their back or maybe a spotted harp if they're lucky or not lucky. I don't know. Which, <laughs> what, what you want to uh, have as your decoration on your body but um uh we will have all our, our notes listed um and so next episode will be a general review so uh, well the next episode know. might actually be an end of year one oh, because right. it is the end of the year actually yeah it is going to be the end of the year so the next episode will actually probably be some kind of end of year wrap up for us it is true. um so unless something tuned, super crazy comes out that we really want to talk right in which case then we'll do that but yeah. stay tuned who knows who knows this is okay. what we'll keep you we'll keep you guessing it's a mystery um so but if there's anything you want us to talk about you know please let us know on our social media or email channels um we are having our annual end of year fundraiser so um if you can are, are willing to um and want to donate please do it helps keep our research going and provide these educational opportunities like the podcast and other videos we have on our youtube channel um, and you can, uh, we'll have a link to that in the show notes as well. <clears throat> um, any amount is, is super helpful for us as a small nonprofit. Um, you can also get merch. So go to our, our gift shop <clears throat> and get the cool, um, everything you could ever want for people who love porpoises and seals and Pac-Man, uh, great gift ideas anyway. Um, so that's ways you can support us, which we really are appreciative. And we thank you so much for this year of, of your support, uh, and listening. So, uh, keep an eye out on our social media channels and we will see you next time. Bye. Bye. This was brought to you by Pacific Mammal Research, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Head to our website, www.pacmam.org, 
that's pacmam.org, to check it out. Also, help us continue providing fun and educational content like this by donating today. Your help is how we can continue to do our work and share it with you. Thanks.